Strange Wills. Stories of strange wills made by strange people, starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, and featuring Marvin Miller and Lorene Tuttle with Howard Culver, and the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Envy, hate, jealousy, greed, anger, despair, and revenge. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of actual wills made under strange circumstances, often by strange people who, frustrated in life, seek this means of self-expression to reach back from the grave to satisfy their secret passions or to seek the victory of a bitter revenge. Names, places, and time have been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person living or dead. Only the last will and testament remains like a living monument to the eternal ego of man. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, I'd like you to hear a message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Alias Dr. Svengali. This is the story of a strange triangle, the sordid story of a man who saw his young and beautiful wife slowly fall under the spell of a mad and evil genius who covered his sinister acts under the guise of psychiatry. In his last will and testament, Philip Martin, on his deathbed, sought revenge against the person or persons he thought responsible for his murder. I remember it all began on a lovely spring morning. Everyone should have been at peace with the world, but... Uh... Mr. O'Connell speaking. Mr. O'Connell, this is Mrs. Marilyn Martin. The wife of Philip Martin. Oh, yes, Mrs. Martin. How are you? Oh, Mr. O'Connell, something dreadful has happened. Philip has had a horrible accident. Oh, I'm sorry. He's here at the Good Samaritan Hospital. He keeps asking for you. Can you come over, Mr. O'Connell? Of course, I leave at once. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'll be waiting in the lobby for you. But hurry, Mr. O'Connell, please hurry. I'll be there as soon as possible, Mrs. Martin. As I drove to the hospital, I wondered what had happened to Philip Martin. I'd seen him on several occasions at different affairs. His reputation had always been excellent, and he had amassed a considerable fortune in the importing business. I remembered, too, that he had married within the last few years, and rumor had it that it was an ideal match. Well, I would soon know. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Martin. Tell me what happened. Philip is dying. Early this morning while I was sleeping, I had a dreadful premonition that he was in mortal danger. I ran to his room just in time. Oh, Mr. O'Connell was horrible. What did you see, Marilyn? Well, just as I got to the door, I saw him fall off the balcony. Fall five floors to certain death. There, there, Marilyn. <laughs> it must have been a horrible shock. I love him so much, Mr. O'Connell. So much. Why did he do it? There was no reason. I'll go up and see him immediately, Marilyn. Oh, tell me, is he is he conscious? Yes, and he keeps calling for you. 
They won't let me in his room. He doesn't want to see me, his own wife. I can't understand it. Wait for me here, Marilyn, and I'll talk to Philip. I'll send for you later. But at the deathbed of Philip Martin, I heard a most unusual and amazing story. I I tell you, John, I did not jump off the balcony purposely. It was it was her voice that that made me do it. She wanted to get rid of me. No, no, take it easy, Philip. What do you mean? Uh, they, they wanted to get rid of me. I know it. I know it. Who are they, Philip? Marilyn, my wife, and and that doctor she's been seeing, that, uh, that psychiatrist. Please, Philip, please, start from the beginning. La- last night, last night when I was sleeping. Philip, Philip. Do you hear me, Philip? Hmm? I... I... I hear you. Philip? I'm calling you. Calling you. Follow me, Philip. Follow. Follow. Huh? Uh, where... Where are you? Walk to the balcony, Philip. To the balcony. Huh? Marilyn, is it you? Open the door, Philip. Open the door. Mm. Marilyn? Where are you? Walk out, Philip. Walk out here. I'm waiting for you, Philip. Waiting. Waiting. John, it, it, it was Marilyn's voice I heard that, that drew me out to the balcony. But I, I fooled him. I, I didn't die. I've, I've lived long enough to change my will, to revenge myself, John. Here. I took the piece of paper he handed me. It was the last will and testament of Philip Martin, laboriously written as he lay dying. In it, he had made the most serious accusations against his wife. He had set up a trust, naming me as executor, which limited Marilyn Martin to a nominal monthly allowance. Time was of the essence, so I hurriedly called in two nurses to sign as subscribing witnesses, and the last will and testament of Philip Martin, in which he named his wife as his murderer, was signed just minutes before he died. That night, alone in my study, I looked over the will and reviewed my conversation with the late Philip Martin. Were his accusations true? Was his wife guilty of his murder? Well, there was only one way to find out. I called upon Mrs. Martin. Her exquisite beauty was still visible in spite of the tragic lines the events of the last few hours had etched on her face. That she was suffering from some deep emotional strain was obvious. As I looked at her, I found it hard to believe that she was the heartless murderer her husband believed her to be. Please be seated, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. I promise I won't keep you a moment longer than is absolutely necessary. But there are a few facts I must know before I file your husband's will. I shall be glad to help you in any way I can. Mrs. Martin, your husband died believing that you were the cause of his death. Oh, no. And that you had an accomplice. Unless you can be cleared of these accusations, which Philip Martin made against you on his deathbed, you may be accused of his murder. Murder? Murder? Surely you don't believe me. He swore it was your voice that led him to the balcony, Marilyn. A deathbed statement of this nature cannot be taken lightly. My voice? My voice led him to the balcony. Oh, no. 
No, I loved him. Why should I destroy him? Frankly, I don't know. But for your sake, I've got to find out, and quickly, before Philip's will is filed for probate. Marilyn, I'm going to ask you one question. I want it answered honestly and truthfully. Are you in love with a certain doctor, a psychiatrist you've been seeing lately? In love with Dr. Cosmo? Oh, nothing has been further from my mind or my heart. Believe me, Mr. O'Connell. Your husband sincerely believed that you and this, this Dr. Cosmo conspired with malice or forethought to kill him. Oh, how horrible. Nothing is further from the truth. He, he did attempt to... But let me tell you the whole story. Perhaps then you'll understand. About three months ago, I saw him for the first time. I was nervous, troubled at the time. Someone told me his methods were unusual, but effective. So, on the spur of the moment, I went to his office. You will please come in, Mrs. Martin. Oh. <laughs> this room. It, it's so weird. Oh, no. Not at all, Mrs. Martin. When you understand it, it is my laboratory. It's so unusual. It, it... So... You will find, Mrs. Martin, that in this room one sheds inhibitions, fears, and complexes. But why such strange things in the room? Everything has its purpose, Mrs. Martin. These purple drapes, an outlet for your hidden emotions. The marble bust of the Madonna and the golden votive lamp offer release to the religious complex inborn in every human heart. The marble couch, here one rests while the mind journeys to the realm of peace eternal. And the music? Well, you will learn that music, properly applied in conjunction with hypnosis, recreates a new life. Yes, it will open for you a beautiful new world that you will not forsake, my dear Mrs. Martin. A world that will bring peace to your troubled mind. Everything you say sounds logical, I guess. Perhaps necessary. And yet, it makes me shiver. Oh, please do not be frightened. There is no need for alarm, I assure you. You are about to become a living part of a great miracle. One that you will never forget as long as you live. And now, if you are ready. Of course. What must I do? Lie down, please. Here on this marble couch. Like this? Yes. Now, place your arms straight down alongside your body. So. Directly in line with your vision, you see a clock. See how the pendulum swings back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. As I play the organ, you will watch the pendulum closely... Do not take your eyes from it, even for a moment. Yes, Doctor. You are the evening star. You are the scent of jasmine, of frankincense and myrrh, in the chalice of love. Your mind, your every thought, shall be attuned to the unselfish love of the Master. Open the door of your subconscious mind that I may enter. For I am truth. I am light. I am love. Your eyes are closed. You are asleep. Tell me, whom do you see? I see only the master of truth. Of light, of love. Your ears are sealed to earthly sounds. What then do you hear? I hear only the thoughts of the master. Then arise and go, for I shall speak to you across the deathless void, and you shall answer me. Yes, you shall answer me. After that, I called on him once or twice a week. 
Then gradually I noticed that he was becoming more attentive, though I'd given him no cause, really. I knew he was in love with me, and I realized, too late, that our association must end. I saw him for the last time the day before Philip... The day before Philip died. He had been playing for me. Do not try to evade the issue, Marilyn. I love you. I have loved you from the moment you entered my office. You can't escape me, you know that. I can't come here again, Dr. Cosmo. You know that I'm married, and I love my husband. Then I shall destroy him. I shall destroy anyone or anything that stands between us. You shall see. You shall see. We will continue with alias Dr. Svengali in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor. Now back to Alias Dr. Svengali, starring Warren William. Later that night, I called upon Marilyn Martin. She told me of the threat Dr. Cosmo had made against the life of her husband, of how he was able to communicate with her through her subconscious mind. Her confession left me with no alternative. Early the next afternoon, I called Dr. Cosmo. This is Dr. Cosmo speaking. Dr. Cosmo, this is John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. As you may know, I represent the estate of the late Philip Martin. How does that concern me, Mr. O'Connell? I think you'll better understand, Doctor, when I speak to you personally. Shall we make it, say, at eight tonight? I would prefer to make it at ten, Mr. O'Connell. Then I shall be at liberty for as long as you like. Ten o'clock, then, Doctor. I will be here. I wondered what the expected meeting with Dr. Gregory Cosmo would lead to. My evidence against this man was purely circumstantial. Just what had he actually done? Who would believe him capable of directing his thoughts through the subconscious mind of a second party, Marilyn, and will her to lure her husband to his death? Yet I knew that in this man lay the key to the strange mystery surrounding the death of Philip Martin. Was the man mad? I expected anything to happen. At exactly one minute to ten. Come in, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Doctor. I'm taking the liberty of locking the door so we won't be disturbed. Come this way, please. We shall go directly into my private laboratory. You will perhaps find my laboratory a bit unusual, Mr. O'Connell. It is arranged for the development of advanced thought in modern psychiatry and hypnosis. Madonna, the golden votive lamp, marble, couch, yes. Everything is here just as she described it to me. You are referring to Mrs. Martin, I believe. Eh? Well, uh, yes, Doctor. (laughs) 
Uh, she is one of the most beautiful women who have ever come to my office for help, Mr. O'Connell. Won't you sit down here, please? Here, facing the organ. I shall play for you as we talk. I find music very soothing to the body as well as to the mind. You are surprised, are you not, to see that my methods of advanced psychiatry call for such an unusual setting? Quite frankly, Dr. Cosmo, nothing you do surprises me. I acknowledge you to be the master craftsman you are of psychiatry. But when psychiatry leads to murder... <laughs> murder? What do you mean? Dr. Cosmo, there's not the slightest doubt in my mind but that you are directly responsible for the death of Philip Martin. And if you like, I'll tell you exactly how you brought it about. Please do, Mr. O'Connell. You flatter my capabilities, but I shall find your story interesting nonetheless. There must always be a motive for murder, Doctor. And you had not one, but two. You were in love with Marilyn Martin. And secondly, you are greedy for the money you thought would be hers at her husband's death. Shall I proceed? Oh, yes, yes. Go on, please. I find it very interesting, very entertaining. Very well. You kept Marilyn Martin under a continual state of hypnosis. That's not new, of course. English psychiatrists have done that for many years in cases of advanced neurosis. But in any event, her mind became in actuality your mind. Your thoughts became her thoughts because in some nefarious way, you were able to implant them in her subconscious mind. Then, you finally decided to go all the way. You were in love with Marilyn. You wanted to possess her more than anything on this earth. So you decided to do away with her husband. You figured out that if you could direct your thoughts into her subconscious mind, why couldn't she transmit these thoughts to the sleeping mind of a third person? In this case, her husband. You tried it and your experiment was successful. Through the mind of Marilyn Martin, you, Dr. Cosmo, became the voice that drove Philip Martin to suicide. Go on, Mr. O'Connor. I, I charge you, Dr. Cosmo, with... with... You can't move, can you, Mr. O'Connell? You have lost your power of speech, the physical faculties of motion. You sit there like a statue. You are a statue, because I have willed it, yes. Mr. O'Connell, you are right. I was the voice. I deliberately and intentionally planned the destruction of Philip Martin, because he stood in my way, just as you are now doing. I love Marilyn. I love her beyond anything this world can offer. I shall have her, too. I am the first to have successfully transmitted thought through the subconscious to a third person. The mind, Mr. O'Connell, just like atomic energy, is on the threshold of great discoveries. Its potentialities are unlimited. If I can send one person to his death, why not many? Why not entire nations? The million dollars ah, is nothing to the money and power I shall have. With my knowledge, Mr. O'Connell, I can rule destiny and the world. Now I shall give you a practical demonstration of my power. But you will not believe to tell about it. My music, the pendulum before your eyes, which you are watching subconsciously, and my power of concentration have hypnotized you. Now I am going to send a new thought to your subconscious mind, Mr. O'Connell. And you will act upon it. Walk, walk to the desk. Walk to the desk. Open the drawer. O open, open. The... Take out the gun. Take out the gun. Place the forehead. Place the gun to forehead. For, for. I stopped him just in time, Mr. O'Connell. 
Just in time. Oh, Marilyn, what are you doing here? Oh, oh I'm dizzy. Here. Here, let me help you. Sit down for a moment. There's nothing to worry about. Dr. Cosmo was dead. I... I shot him. But I... Uh... I don't understand. I couldn't rest thinking about you being here alone with him. I knew you were in danger because I alone know what his evil capabilities are. So I drove over, came in through the basement door and hid behind the curtains. I was here hiding when he brought you into this room. And you saw it all then? I heard. I, I saw everything. When he began his hypnotic music, I recognized the chords. He used the same strain to put me to sleep. I put my fingers to my ears to keep out the sound. Through the curtains, I saw you walk to the desk, open the drawer, take out the gun, and and place it to your temple. And then I... I shot. I shot. And with that shot, you not only avenged the death of your husband, Marilyn, but you ended the career of this monster of evil, Gregory Cosmo, alias Dr. Svengali. Let his memory remain as a lesson to all future Svengalis that human rights cannot be usurped or violated to further their mad plans and aspirations. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of alias Dr. Svengali. But first, a word from our sponsor. again is Warren William. A coroner's jury completely exonerated Marilyn Martin of all responsibility of the death of Dr. Gregory Cosmo. The last will and testament of Philip Martin was duly admitted to probate and Mrs. Martin is receiving the full benefits of the trust estate set up for her under the terms of the will. Thinking back as I often do upon the strange life and career of Dr. Cosmo, the question frequently arises in my mind as to where genius ends and madness begins. For this man was a genius in an evil sort of way. He was one of the first to realize the potential greatness of the human mind. It's too bad, isn't it, that he, he couldn't have directed his research along lines that would have helped humanity instead of trying to destroy it. I wonder where the answer lies. I wonder. <laughs> Next week, I shall tell you the strange story of a man who hated his son with an intensity beyond human reasoning or understanding. Not content with cutting him off in his will with one dollar, he reached out from the depths of his grave in a sinister effort to utterly destroy him. Did he succeed? <laughs> well, for the answer, I invite you to listen in next week to this amazing story about a last will and testament. It's called Black Interlude. saying goodbye. Until next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crippine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Hollywood.